Hey, Christmas times are coming. I said that we're entering the Christmas season. And uh, that's an exciting time. It's also, for some, a depressing time. For some, it's a confusing time. Christmas is um, the time of the year when everybody seems to be happy, er, but at the same time, a lot of people are distant and and. and so the, the thing about Christmas, in fact, I, how many, I don't know, I'm not, this isn't a statement whether you should or shouldn't watch it, but I just saw a deal the other day on a movie they made about, I guess, Charles Dickens. It's the man who invented Christmas. That's the name of the movie, the man who invented Christmas. I believe that was uh, Jehovah. So Christmas is coming, and it is that time of the year when everybody is kind of focused. And um, I usually take the month of December and preach a series of sermons leading up to the birth of Christ, and that's kind of what I'm going to do this year. But uh, I'm looking at it a little bit different because I've been thinking about the theme, the com- and Advent, you all may know the season Advent. What that means is the coming forward or the moving forward. It's the, the Advent season um, as we focus on the Christ of Christmas. And I do want us to focus on the Christ of Christmas and not the commercialization of Christmas. I was having a discussion with that earlier that um, some folks think that I just really don't like Christmas. And that's not true. I do like Christmas. I like uh, the real Christmas. I don't like the uh, ingenuine what all they do at Walmart and the mall and all of the... A movie? The man who invented Christmas, really. Uh, I don't like that part of it. Because that actually takes away from the whole purpose and the meaning of why we stop and celebrate. So as we go forward for the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the reality of Christmas. And I think this morning, before we can really reflect and think and celebrate the coming and the arrival of Jesus Christ, which we will get to when he was born in Bethlehem stable, we know that story. Before we can get to that part of the story, I think we need to backpedal. And ask a few questions, and that's what I want to do. Before we can reflect on the meaning of his coming, we need to determine, was there a need? Why? Why did it? Did you ever wonder, what is the need? Why did Jesus come? Why, why would he come to earth, take on the form of a man, be born in a stable, and all of that? It struck me that I don't know that we've ever dealt with that. And I think in the world we live in today, there's a problem. When I began preaching 20 some years ago, 22, three years ago, I, rem- I, I went, I just got this gun broke in. I went and spent some time with a, a pastor, and in fact, it's my mother's pastor, Brother J. J. Darrell Strain. And uh, there were three or four of us that began, and, and he said one of the most profound things that at the time, it didn't make much sense, but 22, three years, 23 years later, it does. And he said, getting people saved is the easiest thing you'll ever do in ministry. Getting people to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Getting, seeing people saved is the very easiest thing you'll ever do. The most difficult thing you'll ever do is convince them they need to be. Convincing people that they need a Savior. And so, as we look at where we are in the world today. Not that it's really all that different, but there are so many different views of humanity that we are dealing with in our present culture in America. And the problem is not that they don't want to hear the story of Jesus or even find uh, some interest in the story of God. It's that it doesn't really affect them. And, and folks don't know that they need to be, nor do they recognize that there's anything wrong with they, the way they are. And so this is what I want us to do. In the beginning, we're going to look at some passages, and I think you guys are going to put them up, the Genesis passages. Okay, you can follow along. And these are just for, this is in the introductory. We're going to go to another whole book when we get to the sermon. This is just like, but I want us to know some things that happen because the Christmas story begins in Genesis chapter 1. It's where the the entire Christmas story begins. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. This is 126 through 31. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, over all the earth, over the creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. There was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. Moving to Genesis chapter 2, we're going to see a progression. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this, is, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Genesis chapter 4. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offspring, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Genesis chapter 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of, of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Do you see a progression? In the beginning, God said it was good. All that was created. And he created man in his image. And they walked together and they visited in the cool of the evening, but then something began to take place. As we're looking at the question, is there a need for the coming of Christ? Why? I want us to note that something dreadful happened in the process of time. Man became sinful. The heart of man came to the place where it was continually on evil. Much to, so much to the place that God decided that he would destroy everybody. Except for Noah and his family, the faithful. You see, here's the problem. All of us have at least heard and are familiar with the concept that people are just good by nature. They just do bad things. People are basically good. They just do bad things. You see, that's a lie from the enemy, from the pits of hell. People are not basically good. In fact, you and I are not basically good at all. There is nothing good about us. We are evil. We are fallen. We are not righteous. No, not one. The nature of man is not that he's just basically good and he trips up and falls. It is that he is evil and occasionally he does something right. That's the reality of the human nature. But so we face a world that says, no, people are good. Everybody just has good in them. They just struggle sometimes to do good. Philosophy and, and psychology, <coughs> excuse me, they want to teach us and to tell that modern man is a good person. He just has some hang-ups. No, the hang-up is, is that we're not good people. We're evil. And until we can flip the switch on that and grasp the fact 
that you're not a good person. Not righteous. Not, not good in the fact that we are able to stand before God. Now, let me say this. The fact that we are depraved, that we are fallen, that sin has entered into the heart of man and every one of us is that way, does not mean that we're always as bad as we could be. There are some people that are, we do good things. How many of you all think that there's another whole level of bad you haven't got to yet, but you could? You put me in a line at Walmart with 65 coupons and Christmas music playing, there's a level of bad that I haven't seen yet. <laughs> I'm going to bust out on you. There is. You see, to say that we're totally depraved, that we are not good, to say that we are evil in our heart is truth. It does not mean that we are as wicked as is completely possible. That's not necessarily true. There was a time, and we read about it in Genesis chapter 6, when the heart of man was on evil continually, and that generation of people were killed entirely. It also doesn't mean that we live out our sinful human nature to its complete fullest. We don't dive into the bizarre wickedness of evil thought as deep as it could go. It does not mean that we are incapable of acts of kindness and goodness. That, to say that we're evil doesn't mean that we don't have the ability to do some kind things and some good and right things. We do that because we're created in the image of God, and though we have an evil nature, the image of God is implanted upon us, and we can't help but at once in a while do some good things. It may be few and far between, but we can. So to say that we are evil and wicked and incapable of being righteous does not mean that we can't do benevolent things, good things. It means that that is not our nature. It also doesn't suggest that we can't appreciate goodness. Beauty, honesty, truthfulness. We appreciate those things. But what it does mean is that when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, that sin has contaminated every aspect of my life and yours. There is not one area of our life, not one single aspect that has not been affected. Our heart, our mind, our personality, our emotions, our conscience, the motives, all of the things that we are and all of the things that we do were affected by the fall. And so... Just to say that we're good is a misnomer. No. Actually, we are enemies of God. The human nature, in and of itself, without redemption through Jesus Christ, is an enemy of God. It's not naturally good. It loves itself. It is in bondage to its own sins and desires. Side note, short rabbit trail. Oftentimes when we talk about things like this, we immediately think that when we're in bondage to sin and evil desires, that it's the dark stuff that happens in street corners and late at night on TV channels that shouldn't be playing. and all. That's No, you know what it is? Evil desires means that I want what I want more than I care about what you want. That's an evil desire. I desire my way, and it's more important to me than your benefit. That's an evil desire. It means that I think I'm the most important person in my whole world. And whatever I desire, I'm going to get. That's an evil desire. So it doesn't have to be some tawdry thing or illegal. or That's not what, what all of this is about. Because it's easy for us to sit back and say, well, I'm, I don't do all of those things. Yeah, we do. Like I said, that doesn't mean we go to the, the fullest, most dark level, but it means that that level is there. You see, we're blind, we're deaf, and we're dead to, dead to spiritual matters apart from Jesus Christ. What I want to establish this morning is what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. If not, 
the, the guys are going to put it on the board for you. Uh, Paul does an excellent job of explaining the, the purpose of the advent or the coming. Why did Jesus, why do we have this entire season? We've looked in Genesis at what happened to man, the progression from the perfect creation when he's walking with God and he's in perfect fellowship with God. We've watched that all the way through. And if you'll read the fill in on those chapters, it's an amazing story, to the place where Noah and his family are the last ones because evil was in their hearts continually. We have established that as though you think you're a good person, and you probably are a good person by good person standards, here's the problem. We compare ourselves to each other. And if you compare yourself to me, you're probably a better person. And if you look at so-and-so, brother, sister, whatever, and you say, well, I'm as good as they are, that's awesome, but that's not who we're judged against. You see, the comparison is not, am I as good as Dale or Terry or... That's not what I'm going to be held accountable for. Do you know what the comparison is? Jesus Christ. So, quit saying, well, I'm as good as so-and-so, and just put Jesus there and say, how do you match up? Because ultimately, that's the comparison. And so now, we look at what Paul says. If you have Romans chapter 3, let's begin with verse 9. What then... Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now here's a list. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave and they use their tongues to deceive. The venom, venom of asps is under their, lisp, their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He said, well, that doesn't describe me. Really? I'll bet there's enough of us in that list that we're found guilty so let's look this morning at the reason for the season. How many of y'all have that on a sticker or a Christmas card? The reason for the season. The reason for the season. You know what the reason of the season is? Because we're sinners. And we're fallen. And there's none of us righteous. No, not one. That's why there's this Christmas season. Because Jesus came to fix that. So here Paul talks about what sin has done. Sin corrupts our character. Sin corrupts our character. Would you agree with that? I, I think um, even though it doesn't appear, I think there is still a desire of people to be known as a man or a woman of good character. I, I think we kind of want that. We want people to think that we have good character. Now, we've been watching if, you know, all you got to do is turn on the TV or open up an app and find out that obviously nobody has character because somebody's accusing somebody of something continuously. It's like a nonstop rerun cartoon, whatever you want to call it, of dirty laundry list in the public eye. Everybody that's anybody is going to be accused of something and their character comes into question. Well, let me tell you something. Sin corrupts. It eats at the character and the heart of man. You see, we are depraved universally. And that's the problem. Even though we are able to do right things, and even though we talk about righteousness, he says there is none righteous. Now, I want to clarify what he's talking about. He is not, again, talking about the ability to do good things. That doesn't, that's not righteousness. That's not even a righteous character. It's not the ability to speak and do acts of kindness and goodness. It's much deeper than that because even evil people can say nice things occasionally and do nice things occasionally. I'm quite certain 
that some of the most evil dictators and rulers of the world that come to mind, and it depends on how old you are, which name comes to mind, at some point in their life said thank you to somebody. So they're capable. That's not what we're talking about. When he says there is none righteous, he is speaking about the inner character of who we are, our person. And Jeff ain't righteous. And Sandra's not righteous, believe me. I mean, believe me, no, none is righteous. But isn't that what we do? We compare our righteousness to the other people's righteousness. We kind of set a mark. But the inner character of man is flawed. It's sin sick. It is imprisoned and broken and it is without hope. And all of the good things you can do and all of the right things that you can do will never repair the brokenness of our sin sick character. And that's why the Lord said, all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. But we don't fall short in the concept that we do. This is what the other day someone was talking, I don't remember who I was visiting, we were talking about going to college. Oh, it was Dan, my friend was talking about going to college and he said there was this really smart kid in his class that kept ruining the curve for everybody. <laughs> Anybody know that? Anybody experience that? Well, I went to Freel Baptist Bible College, also known as Welch College today. Do you know what the curve was there? Straight line. There was no curve. You got graded for what you did. You didn't get to balance out how it looked in the class. If you did F work, that's what your grade was. If you did A work, that's what your grade was. They were the most judicious and fair in their grading system of anywhere you could go because they said, Jesus is just going to judge you on what you've done, not what your brother did, and we're not going to grade you by what your brother does either. Isn't that awesome? No, we want the curve, don't we? <laughs> no, I really want some really good people. I want like some salt of the earth, grandma cookie making, granddad's whittling toys and singing Jesus loves me to the grandbabies and I want those people that just like pray and it sounds like the gates of heaven open and the angels sing I want some of them in my curve because I know me but there is no curve you're not righteous no not one we are innately depraved. We are universally evil. We are spiritually ignorant. We need Christmas. We need a, a Savior. We need a Redeemer. Our thought processes are so affected by sin that many can't even grasp what is right and what is wrong. I know I've told the story over and over, but I see there's some folks that haven't heard this story here today, so yay, I get to tell the story again. But it's a progression that I've watched in my 53 years. Um, and I'm going to make a blanket statement. This is not scientifically provable. In fact, Barna doesn't even really back it up. This is just observation of Jeff. I'm 53. I'm the last, me and Sandra are literally the last year of the baby boomers. It stopped in 64 when we were born. We're the last of a dying breed of that generation. And our generation was raised in a culture, not necessarily raised in church, not even necessarily raised with the Bible in our house. I was and she was, but many weren't. But we were raised in a culture that... Everyone knew what was right and what was wrong. They just didn't do it. My generation, I'm 53, my generation knew what was right 
and what was wrong. And there was a distinct difference. There were no gray areas. It's either right or it's wrong. And they just chose not to. Now, what they could know, and believe me, I had a lot of friends that absolutely chose not to do what was right. But they did it knowingly. We've raised a generation that has now raised a generation that doesn't even know that there is a right or wrong. We're a dying breed, us middle-agers, us over 50s. Because we look at the world and we can see it in black and white, right and wrong, Word of God. This is right, this is not right. God says do, God says don't. And we see it in black and white. And there is no gray area. Whether we do it or not is irrelevant. We know that this is true. But we are dealing with a generation and trying to minister and love and raise a generation and work with people that don't even see black and white. They just see a gray. It's like a hazy day to them. And whatever you think is okay for you and whatever you think is okay for you doesn't have to be the same for you as it does for me because there's really not any moral standard of right and wrong. Well, that's exactly where we were in Genesis chapter 6. Right? When there was no moral standard because men did whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. Here we are. Paul says, sin corrupts your character. You cannot be righteous because sin will not allow it. And no matter how many good things you do and how awesome of a person you are and how much you care and how much you try and what all of the, th the stuff that you fill your life with, it will never change the fact that your character is condemned by sin. What do we do about sin? I wish I had an answer for you on how to fix sin yourself. Many have tried over the years and they've come up with a long list of what you're allowed and what not allowed to do. And if you can just complete the checkoff list, then you can assure that you're doing everything correct. But the problem is the list keeps growing. The list it just continually grows. And when you get to the New Testament, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders, He says, you're so good at keeping all of the little pieces of the law, but you've missed the spirit of the law. You even tithe on wild herbs that grow in your garden. And your mom and dad are starving to death and you won't help them. You're doing what is right in your eyes. You've put God in your box and you will not let Him get out. Today, if you ask people, who's God? The question used to be, who's God? And the answer was, well, it's the God of the Bible. That's who we're talking about. We're talking about Jehovah God in our culture, right? Today, you ask the question, who's God? What's God? It's not who anymore, it's what? What's God? I'm God, you're God, Earth's God. Everything's God, God is everything. Really? The depravity of man eradicates the image of God and replaces it with a fallen character. And he says, None is righteous. No one understands. No one seeks. All have turned aside. They have become worthless. Hmm. The next thing that does, sin not only corrupts our character, but it defiles our speech. How many of y'all believe that speech is important? That what we say and how we say it, the terms, the words... The inflection, you can say a lot with a handful of words, can't you? And how you say that handful of words makes a difference. Ask one of your children. Have you cleaned your room? Yes. What does this mean to you? Have you cleaned it to my standards? Yes. Is it okay if I come in and check your room? 
Yes. <laughs> Inflection's a funny thing, isn't it? And the conversation, you know, you can say all the right things, but if you say it with the wrong spirit, it's still wrong. And that's what sin does. Sin corrupts our ability to have clear conversation. Jesus said something interesting. The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Out of your mouth flows the contents of your heart. So, the jokes that we tell. <laughs> Brandon was talking about a joke just before church, but we're not going to share that one anymore, are we? Got you, brother. The jokes that we tell, the stories that we tell, the way we embellish interesting stories, the tone that we use with people, whether we are open and loving and actually caring or whether we're judgmental and authoritative, it makes a difference. And so sin eradicates our ability to speak from our heart with the things of God. And it replaces it with a twisted, fallen, introspective, self-centered voice. Any of y'all ever, we were talking about this before church, anybody ever get to travel back in the days before there were uh, devices? You know what a device was when I was a kid? A book. The Rand McNally. Dude, I knew every highway between Alton, Missouri and Craig, Colorado. Because all we had to read was the Rand McNally. No devices. What if I don't want to read? Then sit there and be quiet. But I want, I don't care what you want because it's not about what you want. Do you know if you tell a child today it's not about what they want, they don't even understand what you said. The concept that it couldn't possibly be about me isn't even real. It has to be about me. Mm -mm. No, it doesn't. And when people find out that it's not about them, now they're lost. They don't know how to deal with that. Life's always been about me. Really? Jesus said, no, it was never about you. It's about our Heavenly Father. It's about our Heavenly Father. But the way we speak, he says it defiles the throat, it corrupts the tongue, it poisons the lips, it pollutes the mouth, and the mind follows. That which is flowing in our heart comes out our mouth, and we speak it, and our children hear it, and they repeat it, and they develop their own. And before long, we have a conversation that is toxic. Toxic conversation. And it doesn't have to be all four-letter words. Toxic conversation can be spoken using the Word of God. Did not Jesus encounter toxic conversation from leaders of the church? Quoting the Word of God. Well, Moses says, what do you say? And then he was in the wilderness and Satan himself used toxic conversation from the Word of God. So, beware. I'm not talking about necessarily, though we shouldn't. My dad said one time, because the one time that I said a four-letter word in front of my dad, one time, and I was a grown man at that time, and he said, really? With all the words that we've taught you, that's all you can use? Or four-letter ones? There's such a beautiful language and so many other words to describe. Why limit yourself to these? I never did it again. But I'm not talking about cuss words. I'm not talking about that. Though we shouldn't use those. I'm talking about the heart of what we say. The content. The intention. Are we trying to build up or tear down? Do we desire to win the argument or come to peace with the person? 
Do we desire to glorify God or set ourselves apart as being glorified? Because a lot of folks want the glory. They want their name attached. I've got a really good friend, and he has two PhDs, and I don't know what else. I know that. He's, he's completed two. And if you meet him and talk to him, if you ever use the doctor word, he'll correct you. He says, um, it's not doctor. I'm Tom. Tom Marbury. One of the most godly men I've ever known. Brilliant mind. Humble. If you call him Dr. Marbury, he'll go, uh, I'm just Tom. Other people that have a little PhD, almost, as soon as they get it, they get new business cards with big hawking leathers. Doctor! Whatever. Because they want the recognition. Which one's right? Which one's wrong? What do you desire in your conversation? Do you desire to build the other person up? Or do you desire to build yourself up? You see, sin defiles our conversation to the fact that we can't even have a conversation that is meaningful and helpful apart from the grace and the hope of Jesus Christ. He cleans our heart. He cleans our heart. Then verses 15 and following. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. The way of priests they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. I find it fascinating as you read through the Genesis story that we come from, the, from a time in the beginning when Adam and Eve are walking with God in the cool of the evening and they're, they're fellowshipping with God and he would come down. What a drastic progression we get from there to the days of Noah. The Psalms and the Proverbs ring out with warnings about our conduct and how quickly we can be sucked away. We are a destructive people. Did you know that? We are destructive. We're greedy. We're hateful. We're self-centered. I, I did find this really interesting national survey dealing with greed. Just, this is just one aspect of our conduct. Listen closely. This was fascinating to Jeff. In the scenario that was given, you could receive 10 million tax-free dollars, but to receive it, you had to choose one of the choices listed. And they were all pretty radical choices. But the question was, would you choose one of the choices, and if so, which one? So, two-thirds said they would be willing to choose one of the choices. So two-thirds of the people polled said that for 10 million tax-free dollars, they would choose one. And here's the breakdown. 25% said they would abandon their family for 10 million tax-free dollars. 25% said they would definitely abandon their church. That's easy. They'll do it for a lot less. They'll do it because the coffee wasn't good. Now it gets weird. 23% would become a prostitute for a week. 16% would give up their American citizenship for $10 million, tax-free dollars. 16% would leave their spouse. 7% would commit murder. 6% would change their race. Four percent would change their sex. That's no different. You can't do that. It's just like race. You can't do that. I don't care what you fix on the outside. The inside's still male or female, just as God created. Can't fix that. Four percent would do that. This was the wildest one. Three percent would put their children up for adoption for ten million tax-free dollars. But tell me we don't have. Parents, if you're nudging your children right now, I expect to see you at the altar and pray.
They ain't some mom and daddy's going to come up here and confess before the Lord. I said, I'd do it for $10 today, okay? <laughs> but you look at these statistics and we look at them and, and you know what surprises me the most? Is that it surprises us. The world we live in is so fallen. I'm blessed that there was still a little bit of shock and gasp from y'all and from me because we're in such a fallen, depraved world. We are destructive. We are evil. And Romans chapter 3 points out that every one of us is guilty. If I were to go through and poll everyone sitting here and ask you where you think you rank on the scale of 1 to 10 of righteous or unrighteous, I'm pretty sure if we were honest, most of us would answer way down low, right? You know why? Because in our own and of our own nature, there is none righteous, no, not one. Which is the reason we celebrate Christmas. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God so loved the world that whosoever believed in Him would not perish but have eternal life. God looked at the sinfulness of man all the way back from the beginning. I want to ask somebody to grab their Bible and look up Genesis chapter 3, I believe it's verse 5. Is that the Protoevangelum? I didn't, this is new in my notes, and I probably misquoted it. I could look on Google, but it's not polite for me to be on Google in the pulpit if I won't let you be on Google in the pew. But this is the part I want to make, and you'll find the verse, and it is, He shall crush the serpent's head. He will bruise his heel. You remember that? When the curses were given and with great sweat of his brow man would eat and women would in great pain give childbirth. And the curse was put upon the earth and then the curse was put upon Satan himself. And he said on, the be on your belly you will crawl. And then he makes a statement. The Son of Man, you will bruise his heel, but he'll crush your head. Did you all find that? 15, thank you. 315. I knew it was 3, chapter 3, I couldn't remember the exact verse. Huh? It is a good chapter. Can you got? Yeah, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. 15. Do you know what that is? That is the first verse that speaks of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the first Christmas verse. Because of what we've talked about, because of the fallenness of man, because of the reality of sin, and whether we like it or don't like it, it is what it is. Here we are. You are fallen. I am fallen. I am not righteous, you are not righteous, and neither shall we ever be righteous of our own works. Because we have an enemy. And you know who the enemy is? Us. Our sinful nature. But we have a Savior. We have a Savior. So today, as we begin the process of looking at Christmas, I wanted to say, why even bother, Lord? Was there really a need? Yeah. There absolutely was a need. Because you're not righteous and I'm not righteous. And if I want to be righteous, the righteousness I have will be the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm not good. You're not good. If I have any goodness, it will be the goodness of Jesus Christ that is placed over me. I'm grateful 
that we're celebrating Christmas. It's the time of the year as we roll forward thinking about the coming of Jesus Christ. I hope today that you're thinking about your personal need and the coming of Jesus Christ. I know that oftentimes sin isn't talked about much anymore. I know that. One of the reasons sin isn't talked about anymore is because nobody understands what it is. And nobody likes being convicted of their sins because it hurts, doesn't it? And nobody wants to admit that we're not really basically good people. We really are. We just do bad things. No, no, that's not what the Bible says. But I determined that if we're going to roll all the way up to the birth of Jesus Christ, we're going to explain the story why he had to come for you and me. Because we are wicked and undone. I think one of the, the most beautiful pictures, the Old Testament, was Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, and I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the room. And Isaiah looks and sees the Lord on his throne, high and lifted up, and there were cherubim and seraphim singing holy 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 you know that song we sing holy holy that's where it comes from holy 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 and you know what isaiah said and i looked and i said woe is me for i am undone i am a man of unclean lips one of the reasons that we don't ever face our own wickedness, one of the reasons that we refuse to deal with the truth of our immorality and our fallenness is because we never compare ourselves to God like Isaiah did. Isaiah could have looked at the priest and he wouldn't have said that. Isaiah could have looked at the Sunday school teacher, if you would, and he wouldn't have said that. But Isaiah wasn't looking at other people. Isaiah was looking into the face of God and compared to God, he said, woe is me. So Paul's not asking us to compare each other to each other. Paul has said, I'm going to tell you about the fallenness of man compared to who God created him to be and in the presence of God, every one of us is undone. And the only way to be made whole is by God Himself. Therefore, born unto us in the city of David, a Savior. A Savior. Do you know Him? Jesus Christ, our 